Laura's made books for artists and institutions at the New Museum, but she also works independently, um, and she's someone that, that collects and appreciates beautiful um, books as kind of art objects. Um, so thank you, and uh, let's welcome Laura. <laughs> Can everyone hear me if I'm speaking like this? Okay. Thank you, Yunjae, for that. Um, right, so um, I'm gonna speak about the book as physical object today. Um, so we'll talk about size format stock, talk about printing methods, um, special processes, and then I'm gonna share with you some of my, the books that I design in my own practice. Um, so first, this quote by Ulysses Carrion, the book, a book is a sequence of spaces. So um, books, if I could just wax poetic for a second, coming from architecture, I would, I like to think that books are spatial, that they're sequences with beginnings, middles, middles and ends, that they have infinite possible paths that can navigate, that we can navigate through them. Books are physical objects, books are sequences of spaces. This is a quote from the artist Oliver Larrick's 2010 work versions. For the first time several months ago, I spent hours looking at the facade of the cathedral, but only when I bought a book on the cathedral a week later did I really see it. What I hope to allow you to see is that books can sometimes be as architectural as architecture through the use of materials, construction, and all sorts of physical properties. Books embody ideas in their sequences and materiality, each a new world and new space on its own. So let's start with size, format, and stock. Um, when we talk about size, um, one easy way to talk about size is by um, these sort of um, common sizes that we all know. So we all know a paperback, a biography, an art catalog, a magazine, and many of us know interview magazine, which would fall in an oversized category. So sometimes when you're thinking about the size of a book that you want to make, you can think about it in terms of what size it falls on the spectrum. Because sometimes when you make something the size of a paperback, it will automatically clue the reader in that it has a certain kind of paperback-ish vibe. Um, so actually, the biography in this image is not actually a biography at all. It's an um, artist catalog. So this is an example of this artist catalog sort of inverting the notion of common sizes. It appears as if it's her biography, but in actuality, if you open this book up, it would be just plates of her paintings. So Ben uh, touched on this, but I wanted to mention this book, um, which is a good reference if you're interested in typography, um, page proportion, et cetera. It's called The Elements of Typographic Style by Robert Bringhurst. Um, and basically, he goes into a lot of discussion about the proportion of books, and he created this chromatic scale of page proportions, which is based on uh, kind of like a musical chromatic scale. But um, in doing this, he found that certain proportions, again, kind of clue the reader into a certain kind of um, aesthetic or even time period. So um, the proportion from width to height, if it's a fifth or a fourth, um, ratio corresponds to a lot of books from the Middle Ages, whereas a sixth and seventh proportion corresponds to a lot of books from the Renaissance. So books, books from different times also have different proportions. So if you're interested in that, that's a whole other kind of study that you can start to research. Um, and then the right is a note that I wanted to make to you because some of you are working on projects that have a certain kind of geometry. And let's say um, geometry is so important to your project, it could actually become the way in which you construct a book or construct the proportion of a page so that your architecture is literally embedded in the page itself and the book itself. Um, I'm going to mention some of these. Um, I'm not really sure how much you know, so I'm going to kind of go over things that I think would be um, useful. So in terms of binding, you could do like a perfect binding where the book is cut and then glued into the cover. Um, there's something called sewn signatures, which if you look at a lot of books and some books here, 
you'll notice that the pages are folded and curved around and then glued to the spine, um, and that is indicative of a commercial printing process um, and like a large offset press. These bindings you can do at like a local copy shop or a local printer, or you can also do them yourself in many instances. Japanese binding, which is a stitch form of binding, stud or screw binding, um, or spiral binding. Um, this is a, a really simple binding method, and um, a lot of the complex object books that you may have looked at on this table actually use this method, which is saddle stitch. So it's just um, pages are folded and then stapled together. And if you look at it from the bottom cross section, it's just pages folded and nested in one another. You can also do a singer sewn binding, which you would need a commercial printer for, where it looks like a sewing machine. And you can also do a three hole sewn, which you can find out how to make that stitch if you Googled it online. So in terms of paper sizes, um, there's the international standard paper sizes, which are sort of all nest into each other, which many of you may know, like A2, A3, A4. Um, in the US, it's kind of a bit uh, not as nice. Uh, so, you know, it's like eight and a half by 11, 11 by 17, and then sort of like all hell breaks loose. Um, but in terms of designing your own things, maybe in school, it's important to note that a lot of things can be done using an eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17, which will make your life um, sort of easier in some ways, which we'll talk about. There's also something that um, we won't go into too much detail about, but it's important if you wanna start making um, a lot of books, and that's something called paper grain. So um, like this table is wood and it has it has fibers running a certain direction, so does paper. So paper has a grain that runs in a certain direction. And so this is grain long, and usually in paper notation, the second number is the grain. So this is eight and a half by 11, grain going on the 11, and that's 11 by eight and a half, grain short going eight and a half. And why that's important is, let's say, that you wanted to make a booklet, and so you wanted to fold the booklet. If you fold along the grain, it's going to fold um, really nicely, sharp, precisely, and the book will be soft, like nice to hold, nice to flip through. It'll be kind of floppy. I don't know if you've ever held a book that feels really stiff versus a book that feels soft and floppy. The soft and floppy it doesn't happen unless the grain is going parallel to the spine. So you don't need to know necessarily, but for some of you, that are interested in materiality, this might be um, kind of a fascinating thing to explore for you. I also wanted to give you some reference points. I'm not exactly sure how helpful this is, but if um, you're looking for paper, um, a paper companies, and these are URLs, you can take a screenshot. Um, Spring Hill is like a cheaper copy paper type thing. Uh, papers come in all different colors. Uh, Mohawk, Nina, French, those are American brands of paper and you can get paper. But um, and it, a, good, a place that I use a lot is this place called Glowden.com. And what it is is it has all of these paper vendors, but you can go on there and select uh, small quantities. And you can, you can have them cut it so you can have your paper grain running whatever direction you want. So you can get small quantities and custom cut which is um, useful if you're making a book. So basic paper types, um, un there's basically like uncoated and coated. Other than that, you have like textured and there's uh, thousands of different texture papers. You have metallic. Um, some of you saw this, this book up here, which is, I think it's a metallic paper. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell because it'll be like a, a foil, it'll be a normal paper and then a foil over top, but I think this is a metallic paper. Um, and then there's even special things. So there's fabric papers, there's plastic based papers. You can even print on Tyvek and use Tyvek, Tyvek in making books. And there's a bunch of different methods. So you guys probably have a laser printer and an inkjet printer. There's also, you can do silkscreen or Rezo. 
Um, and on the commercial side, you can do all of those things as well, but you can also do embossing, debossing, foil stamps, letterpress, and offset, which we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some examples of those um, coming up. And then this, I thought this might be um, helpful for you, like different ways of commercial printing if you end up wanting to go that route ever. So print on demand, um, there's like Mixum, Lulu, Blurb, and this place in the Midwest called Bookmobile. Um, that's, they're really helpful about making books. Um, commercial, like small scale commercial printers, you probably know ones up here, but ones near the new museum for me, uh, this place called Expert Printing. They can print digitally, they can print offset. It's small enough scale um, that it's not too costly if you wanna do something in offset. Uh, this place called Post Heritage, and then if you want Rezo printing, there's a place called Textbooks in Brooklyn. And then big, big, big commercial printers, which you may not use, but a place called Linko that does broadsheet newspapers, and a place called GHP in Grand Meridian. Um, so um, I want to speak about a few books whose Formats are determined by their content because how we started this was sometimes you can choose a format based on a stereotype of what that format should be. It's a biography, so it's six by nine, or it's a paperback, so it's four by seven inches. But another way is to look at the content first and allow the content to shape the, the object of the book. So this is a book called Shoot Diary. It's um, a collection of snapshots of the artist designer Tadanori Yoko, and they, all the snapshots were taken by a photographer named Tadashi Kurohashi, and the book encapsulates one year from 1970 to 1980. So it has an OB, an OB band, but if you take that off, you quickly realize that the cover holds two snapshots. And then if you flip through the book, every single page is the exact same. It, it has space for two, two, for two snapshots per page and a caption for each. So in this way, the format of the book is based on the snapshot. And the orientation of the photos determine, is determined by how they fit best on the page. So if it's a portrait, then it gets rotated 90 degrees to become a landscape. So everything becomes a landscape. And if you look at the book from the front, the foredge sort of gives away this, the structure and conceit of the book, which is a year of, or 10 years of photographs, two per page, for as long as they uh, run. Um, this is a book called Your Land, My Land, and the book was made based off an exhibition of artist Jonathan Horowitz. And also, just to note, the names in the parentheses are not authors, those are designer, designers, um, if you're interested. So the, this book was designed by Jeff Hahn. Um, it was based on an exhibition by the artist Jonathan Horowitz. Um, and the exhibition was about the 2012 um, presidential election. So one of the exhibition components was an interactive website that posted on social media the Twitter feed for both Obama and Romney, like simultaneously. And that website was what this book is based on. So when you open up the book, it's um, a Twitter feed. It's a continuous Twitter feed. So Obama's on the left and Romney's on the right and um, colored for their parties. Um, and then cut in between these feeds are essays and other commentary. And I think the dimension of the book is determined somehow by the dimension of Twitter on like some sort of standard screen that they were, they were showing the website on in the gallery. So I think the dimension is very much like locked into how this was served in the actual exhibition. And so, um, What's interesting is that if you see the, the book straight on, it looks purple, right? It's a blend of red and blue. 
But if you look at it from another direction, it looks, the fore edge looks red, and if you look at it from the other direction, it looks blue. And so you can't really ever get away from seeing these things um, concurrently or seeing them together. Um, and this is a nice example of a book with uh, an only image cover. And so it certainly affects how you see the book from here on out. Um, this is an exhibition catalog from 2008 for the New Museum. And actually, I think one of their most subtly radical exhibition catalogs that they've ever made. Um, so the exhibition was called After Nature, and it was, um, it surveyed a landscape of wilderness and ruins darkened by uncertain catastrophe. Uh, it is a story of abandonment, regression, and rapture. Um, but it shared, this, it shared the name of the book by W.G. W. Sabal. Um, and so the designer, Connie Pirtle, decided that actually he wouldn't design a catalog at all. He would buy a thousand mass market paperback books of W.G. Sabald, and then his catalog design would be um, a dust jacket that would wrap around this mass market paperback. Um, so if you open the dust jacket revealing the front cover and the back cover, you see this, this blue, which is the exhibition um, acknowledgments and um, curatorial essay. And then if you unwrap the cover from the front, you sort of have the list of artists, and then you have all of the object labels and all of the description of the works. Um, this book is sort of hard to describe because it's, its design is so embedded in its, in its format and almost um, so subtle, but it's on, it's on the table, so I encourage you to look at it after. Um, but basically, uh, this book is called Tupac and Biggie, and it presents a visual history of Dana Lixenberg's iconic photographs of Tupac and Biggie. So what's interesting about this is it's just a single signature saddle stitch. And um, the first half of the book is all images of Tupac, and then the second half of the book is all images of Biggie. So here, the center spread is um, the photographs featured in the book were commissioned by Vibe magazine in 1993 and 1996. And um, they've been iconic and they've been seen in a lot of places, but so it sort of all emanates from there. And so the, when you open it, the center spread is that these two uh, Vibe magazine covers are kind of like they're both together. But then other than that, pages 32 through 64 are all Biggie, and page 1 through 32 is all Tupac. So it's sort of like acknowledging the, the format, the signature, is an, acknowledging them as separate and then bringing them together. Um, so now um, we're going to talk a bit about printing methods. And I think this is a um, kind of massive, massive topic. Um, but I'm going to share with you some things that I think are helpful. So um, screen color is RGB, and printing when we're printing most of the time, especially if you're using a laser printer, you're printing in CMYK color space. So the RGB model is additive, which means that like red light, green light, and blue light are added together. And if you if you add them all together, you get white, which is in the middle of that Boolean. But CMYK is subtractive, meaning that um, if you print cyan and magenta and yellow and black all on top of each other, you get black. Um, so in, I think um, it sounds obvious, but I think, uh, this could help, you know, understand why people are like, well, you, can you, you can't print white. No, you can't print white unless it's like an actual white ink because CMYK, it will only get um, darker. It can't really get lighter. And this is an example. Uh, it might be hard to see on screen, but this is an image in R RGB versus CMYK. So in the left image, 
the grapes are almost pure green, and the right is a conversion to CMYK. So you see how, especially in that area in particular, it gets dull. So I think it's, it's good to just understand that you're working a lot in screen-based media, you're working a lot with renderings, but a lot of that um, doesn't necessarily translate to print um, with printing on a laser printer, for instance. Um, so on the left is your laser printer, um, and on the right is a commercial offset press. And I think it's super uh, interesting to see this if you've never seen it, but a commercial offset press will, um, there's a plate for each C, C, M, Y, and K, and um, your press sheet will like go through all four kind of drums and get printed on each plate. Um, and a commercial printer, though, can also print with spot colors and like Pantone colors. So we'll talk about that in a second. So this is um, an illustration of if we were to take this image of this poor dog and separate it into CMYK, this is maybe what, if you printed each plate individually, this is what the plates would look like. Um, so you can tell because the image is so red that there's a lot of magenta and there's a lot of yellow because in order to make red, you have to have magenta and yellow. And then this would be if you were adding them together. So you start with C, then you have cyan and magenta, then you add yellow to get the red, right? And then you add black to get all of the dark parts of the image. And this is another one that's like less obvious, but just like a normal scene. So you start out with the cyan, then you go to the magenta and you get like the brake lights and the traffic cones. And then once you have yellow, you can have things like green trees. And then the black again fills in all of the, the high contrast areas of the dark areas. Um, so more printing methods. So in addition to CMYK printing, um, in commercial offset printing, you have the option of using spot colors, so um, Pantone colors. Um, on the left, uh, there's like thousands of Pantone colors, maybe hundreds, I'm not sure. Um, there's Pantone metallics. You can't really see the metallic, but it's sort of like if you print it on gloss paper and hold it to the light, it will like shine. Then there's uh, Rezo, which is basically looks like a small, a laser printer, but it's using spot color ink. So it's basically like if you combine screen printing with a laser printer, you'd have Rezo. And Rezo has a ton of different inks, and it sort of looks like Pantone's, but it's sort of more like dirty and unfinished. And there's a book of uh, Rezo prints here if you'd like to see the quality, because they're quite beautiful. Um, and then foils. So there's also hundreds of different metallic foils that you can stamp and use um, in commercial printing. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some books in which uh, they use color and other um, printing methods to kind of uh, convey the conceptual nature of the book. So this is um, an ambiguous case, and it's Casco issue 11. So basically this book was about addressing the subject of openness. So that includes ambivalence and ambiguity. So how can a book be both ordered and ambiguous at the same time? Well, in this case, it's a, another saddle stitch book, but um, it's like a set of nested saddle stitch books that can come out of each other and, and be nested back into each other. Um, so that's sort of like the disorder of it, but then there's an ordering strategy, which is color. So each book from on the front side of the book goes from purple to red, and on the back side of the little booklet, it goes from purple to blue. So if you dump them out and, and kind of leave them all over the place, then you can always put them back together based on the color code. And even inside, color is used to distinguish voice. So here's an interview between two people that carries the red versus blue color. 
I think um, this book is a really good example of how to use uh, color coding in a really um, precise and simple way. So this is the Center Cultural Swiss uh, archive book that spans three years, 2007, 2008, and 2009. Um, and the book is an archive for the institution over three years. Um, but in order to distinguish the three years, the only, the only thing that they do is to use like a different color. So all of the images spanning three years in the entire book are all treated the same way. They all sort of have this like uh, low fidelity photocopy look. They're all black and white. Everything is black and white, except the information that organizes it, that ties it to a specific time and place. So page number, caption, date, author, et cetera. All of that info is color coded to a year. So orange is 2000. Um, seven, green is 2008, and purple is 2009. Um, this is a book, uh, Ben showed the cover of it as well as an as a example of an image cover. Um, this is really another fascinating use of color to communicate an idea about the content. Um, so this book is called Birds of Paradise, Costume as Cinematic Spectacle. And it looks at early cinema and silent cinema from 1910, 1920. Um, and the movie industry is sometimes called the silver screen, right? So um, this book brings that aspect to life. So it has um, sections of black pages, and all of the printing on the black pages is in silver. And I encourage you to check it out, because it's hard to show in a slide, but um, it's on the table here. But basically, the designer, Lorenz Brunner, uh, developed with a printer a way to print for color, but using also silver as a, as a base for, for what would be the light parts or white parts of an image. So it's sort of like silver metallic ink mixed with um, probably CMY or other, other colors. Um, and so it's like, it's a four color mix that I think is completely custom to, to this book. And the kind of black and white images that aren't color are just pure silver ink. And I think the intent was to simulate the flickery filmic aspect and the sparkle of these early, uh, early cinematic um, experiences. This is the Resographic Printing Guide by Color Library. It's also on the table. And this gives you a sense of uh, what it's like to print in Rezo. So Rezo, it has like a whole set of spot colors, um, you know, like 20 colors that you can choose from depending on what printer you find. Um, again, there's that printer in Brooklyn that you could um, ask if you wanted to investigate this kind of printing. Um, but this, this book explores the same image through every single page except using different spot colors, or different Rezo duotones, or quad tones, or tritones. So basically, you can take any image and you can break it down into two colors, three colors, four colors, and um, it has like a certain kind of effect on the outcome of what you get. Maximage is a studio in Switzerland, and they're super interested and adept at um, printing methods, imaging colors, and more. And I want to show you this, this book that's also on the table, that if you flipped through it, you would see that it's just colors. It just looks like this. It starts off with two colors, three colors, then four colors, and five colors. And um, what they say about this book is that it's a tool for designers starting with between two and five spot colors and adjusting hue and tone live on an offset press, the book is organized in these custom colors as, as they were mixed live on press. Two colors, then three, then four, then five. 120 combinations of ink were tested. The book contains 450 spot colors that evolved over printing a total of 500 books, and each book is slightly different. So I wanted to show you like a quick video of, of of it because you'll understand sort of like what an offset press is and then how you could uh, sort of like affect the process of it. Whoa. 
That's if we just go lighter. The lemon yellow, warm red, cool red, we had blue. We had uh, two different uh, dirty stuff inside. What are the dirty stuff? Dirt is always, you don't know yeah, yeah. how dirty you are. <laughs> correct glue right now but actually the you see that the under color has an input of the of this, uh, and the, the black makes it more toward the, towards the green that uh, it shows the image positive and then it goes over the gum gumito uh, and the paper runs here and the adding of the color here, if you add color, it always takes half of the color away. Okay. Right, so they're just mixing those colors, just like live, on site, so that um, that dark blue that went to light blue then it became light blue in that book. And there's another book, there's many other books somewhere out there that have all the variations in between of that blue. Um, another uh, aspect of um, printing methods is edge printing. Um, so on the left, uh, Artist Cocktails by Ryan Gander, it looks like the edge is printed, but it's actually not. It's just spot colors that are printed and to the edge and cut, and so then you see them on the edge. Um, then you have examples of paint, painted edges, so like Black Sun or Frankenstein set. Um, sometimes the book is literally clamped down and sprayed with a color. Um, the, the, a book that I designed uh, in the middle, it's gilded and that's also on the table. So they squeeze the book together and then they iron on like a gold foil, um, and that's usually how gilding is done. And then the book on the far right is another book that I did, which is actually printed. So it's two color printed. It's printed with copper ink and black ink on the edge. Um, so more special processes. Um, there's tip-ins, so you can um, make a, something to insert in the book and like kind of glue it in there. Um, there's like a fold out, so many of you have probably seen fold outs um, in books. I think there's a Diller Scafidio Renfro book that's all fold outs, uh, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> there's like die cutting, uh, so you literally like cutting a hole in the book or like making an alternate shape. Um, and then there's varying page lengths, which we're, which we're also about to look at. Um, so this is a book that has an alternative shape. It's called the Public Architecture School Brussels, designed by Jeff Hahn. And this is a book for an architecture school. And um, I think I asked Jeff about it once, and he said, well, it's an architecture school, so it's in perspective. So like playing on the idea of like making something in perspective or three-dimensional, because that's sort of like your territory. Um, but it's, it's also... So it's angled at a seven degree angle, and it's also here on the table too. Um, and why a seven degree angle? I think the printer, I think it was printed in China and the printer, that was the maximum angle that he could do and keep the sewn signature construction intact. Um, so that's an interesting limitation that was found in making this object. And then when you open it up, 
the text and the images are kind of conforming to this perspectival shape. So it sort of has this like really intense force perspective, but in actuality, um, it's kind of, it's, it's like kind of very flat. So it has an interesting uh, il il illusory aspect to it. Um, this is a book also on the table. It's really hard to understand, um, so I would encourage you to um, hold it as an object, but it's called A Well-Respected Man or Book of Echoes. And, um, sorry, I want, a th that's like a leftover note of like, can I photograph this? Um, it's really, I really tried to photograph it. It's really hard, so I would, I would um, encourage you to look at it. But um, basically, it's a book of reverberating voices as they describe it, or conversations about um, a very specific post-colonial condition in the Netherlands. So um, many texts reference the same Dutch uh, literary piece. So it's a bunch of people having conversation about the same thing. And so there's this idea of echoing. So um, how do you reflect echoing, reverberation, and conversation? And in this case, again, it's a saddle stitch uh, with a cover over it. But there's a bunch of different page lengths. So when you open it from the front cover on the left, you get a set of cascading uh, table of contents. And if you open it from the back, you also get a set of cascading table of contents. Um, and then further, in each section, the page length is short or wide. Uh, this is the first page open of the very narrow section. And everything, of course, has to conform to that format. So now you have a single column of narrow text. And you have this very landscape image that in order to be kind of like big and visible has to be rotated to fit on this kind of narrow column. Um, this is a book that was uh, brought to my attention by Min Hee, who will be speaking next. Um, it's called Pre-Columbian Art in New York, and it was designed by Keith Goddard in 1969, I think. Um, it's a book of selections of works from the Museum of Primitive Arts collection. Um, from a certain period of time in 1969. It's also constructed as a single signature and it has two different papers and they're two different lengths. So you can see from the bottom, the side view, it has this white paper that's pretty short and this brown paper that's uh, longer. And so what do those two different page lengths um, offer in this scenario? And in this scenario, it's really fascinating because it's sort of like on the the longer paper, it's all of the details about the works, like the object labels, the materials, um, all of that kind of like administrative information that museums hold. And then on the interior shorter cut paper, it's sort of the collection, sort of this like nice space where the collection could live. Um, and what's even cooler is that Keith Goddard built um, like a scale so that when the pages line up together, there's a scale going and you can kind of like have a sense of how big these objects are in actual, in actual life. Um, so I thought it's sort of interesting to think like in your case, like how do you uh, explain or show scale of your work? This is a book of essays called Amateur and um, I wanted to bring it up quickly because it's another sort of like architectural move of, um, of um, page cutting. So the book is like a normal textbook. It's like white paper, black text. And then all of a sudden, every so often, every like increment of time, you have these interruptions of black paper, black printed pages that are actually cut uh, horizontally across the middle. Um, so what does that do? Well, that allows the reader to flip-flop and resequence them as they will in any order that you desire. And so the idea being that the reader is an amateur editor of these editorial sequences. So in the book Amateur, you become the amateur editor. By the way, this is so flexible. This is a catalog of work for, and again, sorry about that. Um, this is a catalog of work for sculptor Gabriel Curry. Um, and his work is typically associated with um, value commerce and the 
banal poetry of consumer goods and objects. So this is a book designed by OKRM for an exhibition called Sorted and Resorted, in which the artist used materials to organize his works in his show. Um, and he sorted his works in the show into four categories, paper, plastic, metal, and construction. Um, and so uh, following that logic, the catalog is also designed in four sections, um, paper, plastic, metal, and construction. It's also on the table. It also has this um, Swiss binding where like it's a hardcover, but you take it off and it's sort of not the spine is not adhered to the book block, so that's sort of an interesting thing to look at. So here are the four sections. So these are designed on the predominant, based on the predominant materials and the artist sculptures, but then those materials become translated to the book. So the metal section starts with metallic paper or metallic printed paper. Uh, the plastic section starts with a synthetic coated paper. Uh, the paper section is like the paper is so uh, thin and see-through that it really, I guess, shows its paperness, maybe, was the idea. Um, and then the construction section is like this very um, soft, almost fabric-like paper, like almost like um, insulation or something. So um, I'm going to talk about some of my work now. and. Some of the things that I do correspond to some of the things I've been talking about, and others not. But you know, when it's your own project, things sort of like ebb and flow and come in and come out. Um, so as Yoon-Jae mentioned, I am the senior designer at the New Museum. And uh, sometimes we do exhibition catalogs with artists. This was from 2018. Uh, it was an exhibition called Nathaniel Meller's Progressive Rocks. And this is a gallery guide I designed for the, for the exhibition. Um, so maybe a note about what Ben mentioned is in this case, especially for a museum, sometimes I think a, an only typographic cover is um, really effective because there's so much visual information in the museum already. and. Um, in terms of images, I want the person in the museum to be looking at the actual art in the space, not a piece of art that I'm putting on a cover of a publication. So this one was typographic. It's a typeface drawn by my friend Matt Wolf, And I created three alternate O's for this typeface because the title is called Progressive Rocks. So the O's become the rocks and they're progressing um, down the cover. Images is yourself. Ooh. You, sir. You did this. Computer, you would better tell me everything right now, or I'm going to hack you. I am awestruck. The Neanderthal spectrum has a recursive structure with its own history written in it, in blue passes. Look here, his story continues. So that was the exhibition, and it's sort of important to establish the environment because the materials of the publication are in direct response to that environment. So the exhibition with this giant talking robotic egg, it was sort of all in the dark and the only light in the exhibition was coming from um, from the, either the animation work or the film work or like um, this egg spotlight. Um, it also, what is also important materially is some of the work in the exhibition like this. <laughs> so the exhibition was so visceral. There was this guy vomiting in the corner every 30 seconds. Um, and so the fact that it was dark and the fact that there was a lot of vomit associated gave kind of was the reason why we ended up with this color. And this color is a four color build. So it's a neon. It's like Neon, so instead of CMYK, it's neon blue, neon pink, neon yellow, and black. Um, and what that, it does a lot of things, but one thing it does is it makes it glow in the dark. So that was good because of the exhibition being in the dark. And then second, it was this vomit color. So it was kind of this gross um, color, which was perfect kind of for uh, Nathaniel Miller's. 
Um, I like using kind of dumb system fonts. Um, and his work is really probing at our understanding of um, ourselves and our differences. And he uses a lot of Neanderthals in his work. And he sort of puts them as scholarly figures instead of dumb um, uh, species, which we typically associate them with. So I, I wanted to use kind of a dumb font throughout. So I use Arial rounded bold, which I is like one of my favorite fonts. Um, and then, you know, it's like a typical exhibition guide. So one side is a poster that um, Nathaniel made, and then we decided we would like dip it in that vomit color. So his uh, artwork is sort of like, um, yeah, like really dipped in that color. And then on the other side, all of the information that you desperately need to know is in is in that color, so that it's glowing in the dark when you're in the in dark exhibition, and then all the other stuff like the, uh, you know, extended labels and stuff like that is like uh, on white paper because it's not as um, crucial. Um, sometimes I draw maps for exhibitions. This one ended up being kind of silly and like completely out of scale. Um, and this is a preview of what what the ink looks like in the dark. So it was, um, it really kind of worked. Like you could read it in the dark, which was nice. And what was also nice is um, Nathaniel Miller's wife wore a matching shirt to the exhibition. And then so we made him like more tour shirts um, with the typeface and the poster. And it was mostly because we kept thinking about this title, Progressive Rocks, and it has a title of like rocks progressing, but it also has this rock concert sort of vibe where it's like progressive rocks. Um, so that was the impetus behind the, the tour, tour t-shirt. Um, this is a, a book that I designed in 2018 also. Um, it's called How We See Photo Books by Women and it's cataloging um, 200 or more photo books by women or non-gender, non-binary non photographers. Um, and this, it's hard to see, but this is all silver ink. So everything you see that's gray is silver metallic ink. Whoa. Um. <laughs> this is like an adventure presentation. <laughs> So, okay, so in this case, why am, I using, why am I using silver ink? So in this case, the conceptual link was that I was considering early phot photography and film and the chemical technologies and development and how silver was used in this process. So developing film includes like these silver halide crystals and I got like really involved in that. And I thought like, okay, the whole idea of this book is that there is a whole set of folks that are under, have been underwritten and underrecognized in the field of photography. So let's like expose them. So let's use this material for exposure to like bring them to the forefront. Um, these are, so the back cover is just all the names. And again, just like bringing the names of these uh, figures um, to the cover. And the inside is really, really simple. It's almost encyclopedic. And the idea for me was to make it as clear as possible, as usable as possible as a reference. Um, there is one thing, though. Silver ink is on every single page. And it's impossible to see. But everywhere you see a drop shadow, like this, this faint shadow around the image and around every single image in the book is all silver ink. And, um, so that was a way for me to kind of create this like small but subtle gesture um, throughout the book. And again, um, really clear, every photographer has a full spread. Um, there's a bunch of navigational systems like tabbing systems. Um, I don't think that's a good rag, by the way, <laughs> just saying that. Um, and then, so if you unfold the cover, you see the images and you see all the photographer's names. But if you look inside the flaps, if you kind of look in the space that has been underlooked or underrecognized, then you see all of the books 
um, by all of the photographers. And it was another way to kind of like get at that idea of like really revealing this cast of characters who um, uh, should be, uh, should actually be center stage. So um, this is my thesis book from Yale and it's an example. The cover is the one on the right. The back cover is the white one, um, but the book is an index, and so the index is on the front cover and the back cover, and um, all it is is an index of 81 projects that I did when I was in school, chronologically from one to 81. And I think sometimes that's a good way to organize a book, sometime when you don't know how else to organize it. Um, so how did I put my books in a book? So this is a book that I designed in this book, and so most of the books that I designed are just in there, like spine lined up to spine, and they're just full scale. So however big they actually were in real life is how big they are in the book. Um, so in the back of in the the back of the book is where all the writing and descriptions are, and all of the reference materials, and um, thinking about indexing, I took stock of all the colors that I used in my work and I figured out that actually it was sort of like a four color build. It was blue, um, hot pink, gold, and black. So uh, Color Library, who I've um, shown you their Rezo book, Color Library made uh, with me a custom four color uh, profile that is those colors. And so at various points in the book, um, we stop and we look at the works uh, re reprinted in this like new um, four color build. And so these works looked slightly different um, in actuality, but in the book, they look as if they're seen through the lens of these colors that I use most often. And then, of course, um, I, there's this idea of this book is a, like a floppy paperback, but then there's this other element of um, of uh, the gesture of, of formality. So I, for me, I like the contrast between those two things, and so um, I gilded the paperback. Um, a related book is this book that I made for the New Museum. Um, the exhibition Nari Ward, We the People, opened in February 2019, um, and I made the catalog for it. Um, this is an exhibition view inside the new museum, and um, what's important to notice is this artwork on the left, this copper plate work. So Nari's punctured geometric patterns in the panel reference Congolese cosmograms in ancient prayer symbol that represents the cycle of birth and death, and et cetera. And um, he encountered the symbol in a visit to um, an African Baptist church in Savannah, Georgia, which was part of the Underground Railroad. So holes of similar patterns are cut into uh, plates and floorboards, and they uh, allowed people to breathe when people were um, kind of stopping there and hiding on, on the course of the, along the course of the Underground Railroad. So to me, I thought like this work is um, super important to preserve and su super important to remember. And I think one thing about art catalogs is people sort of buy them, put them on coffee tables, and they just sit there uh, forever. Um, so my intention with this book is to make the artwork and to make the copper plate and to, to edge it all around through the two color printing um, so that even if it was in a stack of books from all four angles, it would sort of still be a reminder of this um, artwork. Um, so this is a stack of them. Um, so I, it's interesting, I'm glad uh, Ben brought up the reference of like the Gutenberg Bible and these like tall, narrow columns, and I think um, I thought about the spiritual aspect of Nari's work a lot and about that church. And so the interior typography is 
has this contrast between being really crude and also being kind of spiritual. So it takes the long, thin columns, the justified columns from spiritual texts, but the font, again, is like aerial, narrow, bold, or something you can just see on a sign anywhere. It's not, you know, it's again, kind of just something available for everyone to, to use. And um, the size of the captions throughout the book are the same exact size of the curatorial essay text. And for me, that was really important because I think that the artwork and the materials of the artwork and the intentions behind the artwork are as equal as um, a critic or a scholar or a curator's opinion about that artwork. And so for me, that was a very subtle way to put them on the same plane. Here's the, the glamour shot. Um, and so I also do, uh, I also designed this book with uh, James Graham and Isabel um, Kirkham of it with uh, the Office of Publications here. And this um, came out recently. It's John May's book, Signal Image Architecture. So one idea in this book is that architecture is already an image. And an image is sort of never ending, like always beginning, always ending, like always in flux because, um, read the book maybe. Um, so, one, so one thing about this book is we, we chose a material of like a clear iridescence because it's sort of like not really a color. It's, it's like all colors, no colors. It can, be, it can be a color. So it can be, you know, blue. It can also be dark blue. It can also be red, yellow, orange. Or as it's sitting on the table here, I don't see any color at all. So it sort of has this um, material aspect of being always in between something. Um, the book discusses the first, uh, the creator of television, John Logie Baird, and um, this is like that tiny book, this flap image of that, of, um, that man who created television is uh, full scale. So it's interesting to, to see it and, and to know that it is full scale because you realize like how big the first television image was, was like really, really tiny. Um, we also did it, we did, so the iridescent foil and then we also embossed it. So it kind of is raised and kind of has a texture. Again, this is a full scale portrait of John Logie Baird. Um, and this is the interior. And you see this image is kind of going into the gutter. So um, this is sort of hard to explain, but um, when you print commercially, you're, not, you're printing page by page, but the pages are arranged in a block like this. So it's like a press sheet, and then it gets cut and folded into like a signature that's in that thing. So uh, we were thinking about what is an image in terms of book printing, and we decided that, okay, an image is a press sheet, so we designed the images in this book based on the press sheet, not based on the page. Um, so here's a diagram of how images are placed on the press sheet and kind of going over pages, right? Um, so then in the book, you see artifacts of that by a page uh, image going off one page and then coming back on the other page, because in the construction of the book, those were printed next to each other and then cut and separated. Um, here's another example of that. And another example. Um, and this is also another example of um, kind of a nod to another designer. Um, so Ben showed the book Speaker Receiver. And in that book, it's about speaking and receiving, right? And so this book is also about signaling. So in Speaker Receiver, Julia Bourne, every time she ends a chapter, the next one begins at the same horizontal location. So as a nod to that, every time the chapter ends, the next one begins in the same location. So this one ended three lines from the bottom, and so this one starts three lines, three lines from the bottom. Um, and in the back is the only place you see the images in their entirety, but they're very small, very small index. 
Um, yeah, and that's the book. Thank <laughs> you.